Mysticism is defined as an attempted subjective union with God or spiritually experiencing divine knowledge inaccessible to the intellect, usually attained through some sort of esoteric practice that involves bypassing the ego or a form of self-surrender. Methods of entering into the necessary trance state include prolonged dancing to repetitive music, chanting a mantra or prayer, self-flagulation, the use of psychotropic substances, various forms of breath work and meditation, self-hypnosis, such as staring at a certain point or object, through the use of a pendulum, and by various activities that exhaust the body and tires the mind in an effort to bypass self-awareness to reach into the deep subconscious or collective unconscious reaching the deeper self. Of course, one of the most powerful techniques traditionally used to achieve gnosis is through tantric sex. Gnosis is the Greek word for knowledge, the type that comes from within, such as intuition, which is accessed in ancient mystery schools through intense, ecstatic arousal. In Gnosticism, Sophia is a feminine aspect of God, which represents a divine, internal wisdom available to the individual without the need of a middleman such as a priest, rabbi, pope, or imam. Whether attained through meditation, sexual practices, or the use of drugs, shamans, alchemists, and kabbalists believe that it was necessary to enter into altered states of consciousness in order to perform what many consider magical arts, such as divination, clairvoyance, or obtaining direct divine knowledge. Much of what Western civilization considers distinct spiritual beliefs, such as Gnosticism, Kabbalah, philosophy, alchemy, Tantra, and other esoteric practices that fall under the umbrella of the occult can all be traced back to the ancient Aryan Magi, from where we get the modern term magician from. It's from this school of thought that European secret societies obtain their mystical traditions through organizations such as the Knights Templar, Rosicrucians, and Freemasons, which base their nomenclature on Judeo-Christian and even Islamic literature, however, predates all Abrahamic faiths. Known in the Bible as wise men, the Magi were technically a subclass of priests in the ancient Persian Empire, but were not really part of the mainstream Zoroastrian religion, although they greatly influenced it, as well as all belief systems of the Orient, which is a term that simply means East. The Magi were astronomers, and it's from them that modern religions received their encoded layers of astrotheology, meaning references to the zodiac, which is not only reflected in the 12 months of the calendar year, but the 12 ages of what Plato calls the Great Year, a 25,920 year cycle also known as the Procession of the Equinox. The knowledge of such a long cycle implies that there's been a tradition of keeping track of the movement of the stars that stretches back into the Pleistocene, or Ice Age, when civilizations such as the fabled Atlantis allegedly existed. Whether this magical tradition really stretches that far back into prehistory is debatable, but what is clear is that its influence in medieval European history particularly in regards to a one-time Catholic priest named John Dee. Born in 1527, John Dee was an English alchemist, astrologer, court philosopher, and exceptional mathematician who entered Cambridge University when he was just 15 years old, where he excelled and became a junior faculty member before even taking his degree. After graduating, he went to Paris, where he delivered a series of well-received lectures 
on the Greek mathematician Euclid. After lecturing and studying on the European continent between 1547 and 1550, Dee returned to England, became astrologer to Queen Mary Tudor, and shortly thereafter was imprisoned for being a magician, but was released not too long after. Dee met the future Queen Elizabeth while she was being held under house arrest by Queen Mary. The two developed a friendship that lasted for the rest of their lives. As queen, Elizabeth gave Dee money. More importantly, she protected him from those who accused him of witchcraft. Besides practicing astrology and doing horoscopes in the court of Elizabeth I, whose favor he enjoyed, he also gave her lessons in the mystical interpretation of his writings. Dee's house in Mort Lake near London was for many years a major center of science in England. Dee salvaged many rare and ancient scientific writings that had been scattered when Roman Catholic churches and monasteries were ransacked during the Reformation, and his own library of more than 4,000 books may have been the largest of its kind in Europe at the time. To give you a feel for Dee's own work, I'll read you a short sentence from the hieroglyphic monad, and I quote, before we raise our eyes to heaven, Kabbalistically illuminated by the contemplation of these mysteries, we could perceive very exactly the constitution of our monad as it is shown to us not only in the light, but also in life and nature, for it discloses explicitly, by its inner movement, the most secret mysteries of this physical analysis. End quote. In these most hermetic work, the monas hieroglyphica, which means one hieroglyph, or the hieroglyphic monad, published in 1564, Dee believed he had found a hieroglyph, a hitherto hidden symbol, which contained in its form the very unifying principle of reality, which contains within it all the most elementary principles of the universe. It is to be contemplated upon and fixed in memory as an archetype applicable to all studies. Dee spent most of the time in his library where he explored the Talmudic mysteries, the Rosicrucian theories, and a host of other obscure and occult subjects such as Enochian magic. He claimed that by gazing into a crystal he could communicate with otherworldly spirits and even wrote about how as he knelt in prayer late one autumn he was visited by the angel Uriel. I will leave it to my viewers to decide if this was an actual experience or an interaction with his own subconscious mind, or as Jung would say, an archetype of the collective unconscious. In any event, he claimed that the angel that appeared to him promised to be his friend and companion as long as he lived. D also associated with other occultists, for example, Edward Kelly, a lawyer who stood accused of necromancy, which is the practice of using dead bodies for divination. Dee and Kelly recorded hundreds of spirit conversations, including an alleged angelic language that they called Enochian, which are claimed to represent a pre-Hebraic language. That said, some researchers have suggested that Enochian was a code D used to transmit messages from overseas to Queen Elizabeth in his alleged capacity as a founding member of the English Secret Service. Others have claimed that this Enochian language, which is supposedly from the time before Noah and is used in Enochian magic, is part of the system of magic used by Aleister Crowley and the Golden Dawn and of the Necronomicon to contact intelligences from other dimensions or evoking, quote, the old ones. As Dee went deeper into the occult, he turned his back on Queen Elizabeth and set off on a journey that took him beyond the boundaries of religion and morality. He risked everything in his quest and his diaries record how ultimately he became the instrument of forces beyond his control. The language Dee allegedly sought 
was said to contain the power by which nature was framed and the whole universe was constructed, the very mathematical framework of all the mysteries of creation, the alchemical key to unlocking the secrets of the universe letter by letter. After months of scrying and hundreds of hours of looking into the crystal ball, the angels revealed the alleged Enochian language based on an alphabet of 22 letters, its own words, grammar, and syntax, and resembled no known tongue, although some scholars have compared it to Hebrew. When the Pope heard that D was being granted audiences with Emperor Rudolph, he sent spies to investigate and concluded that D was a threat. The Pope then presented a document to the Emperor accusing Dee of being a black magician while attempting to seize the heretical books of angelic conversations. Dee was eventually expelled from the Holy Roman Empire and ended up in southern Bohemia. They were given six days to get out of the empire and fled Prague in fear for their lives. With nowhere to go and no prospects of patronage, things were looking desperate when they received word that a nobleman from southern Bohemia requested their alchemical services. Even more surprising, Emperor Rudolf had sanctioned the arrangement. The relief that John Dee must have felt after being persecuted, kicked out, the Pope's after him, he's got nowhere to stay, his family's stuffed into two carriages with all his books and possessions, and finally he's allowed to find sanctuary here in Trevon, in Rosenberg's castle. Elizabeth I wasn't a real patron to John Dee. He wasn't funded enough to pursue his experiments and his science. For the first time, this is a safe haven for them. It's a sanctuary. Rudolf II was under extreme pressure from the Pope, but believed that Dee and Kelly were on the verge of finding the formula of the Philosopher's Stone. He did not want to openly defy the Pope, and secretly installed them in alchemical laboratories in the town of Trebon, a hundred miles south of Prague. Right in the middle of all of this, something extraordinary happens. It's just absolutely off the map. If everything else has been extraordinary, this is off the map. They carry on the angelic conversations here, and it takes a very sinister and very strange twist, because Medimi, their spirit guide, their angel, uh, makes a request. They get asked to do something very bizarre. Madimi appeared, and she said, nothing is unlawful which is unlawful unto God. One committing adultery on my behalf shall be blessed eternally and given a heavenly reward. The angels, or Madimi, reveals herself naked in the crystal and says that they have to cross match with each other's wives. Dee and Kelly have to swap wives. So here they draw up a contract after two days that they all solemnly sign and they do go ahead and recording in Dee's diary the pact is fulfilled. There is something very empowering about the breaking of taboo. Certain sex practices are seen as being able to enhance magical awareness to put you into a different state of consciousness. Laying there in a room, listening to your wife have sex with your business associate and magical associate, while you were laying there with their wife, this very real physical act might have been a step too far. This was as far from theory as it could possibly get. So there's actually much more going on spiritually than just some wife swapping here. They're not just swingers, they're sinners. And in Renaissance Europe, that really is tampering with eternity. But it spells the absolute end of Dee and Kelly. Nothing is the same again. Um, it changes everything, and the angelic conversations come to an end. Dee returned to England in 1589. 
Queen Elizabeth had lost interest in her noble intelligentsia, and Dee was desperately short of money. The final blow came when his wife Jane gave birth to a boy, the product of her unholy union with Kelly. Dee never questioned the validity of his angelic actions, in the sense that he never thought he'd just been defrauded by Kelly, um, that he'd been strung a line. He believed in them right to the end. He buried his papers or hid them in, in secret drawers in, in chests. That's how they were found subsequently. He did so because he wanted the message to be carried on into future generations. Dr. John Dee died in 1608. He never deciphered the Enochian language, but it formed the basis of a magical system that continues to be practiced by occultists. The language's origin and what happened between Dee and Kelly during the angelic conversations remains a mystery. 58 years after John Dee's death, a heretical rabbi by the name of Sabbatai Zevi declared himself Messiah in 1666, declaring that redemption was available through acts of sin, which included sexual promiscuity in much the same way that Dee was instructed to do with his scrying. Kabbalistic techniques of directly communing with the divine bypassing the need for religious middlemen not only alarmed the Pope in the case of John Dee, but was denounced by rabbinical leaders during the rise of Sabbatai Zevi. That said, the Knights Templar were also accused of Gnostic sexual acts that were considered heretical, despite their vows of chastity, which speaks to the ancient tantric techniques also practiced by Taoist monks and Hindu yogis for achieving orgasmic, trance-like states of consciousness without undergoing the traditional climax associated with the act of procreation. These techniques were allegedly passed down to the Babylonian Magi and ancient Egyptian priest cults and became the basis for European esoteric alchemy as practiced by secret societies such as the Rosicrucians and Masons. Born in 1869, Grigory Rasputin was another self-proclaimed mystic who claimed to be able to achieve altered states of consciousness through prolonged carnal activity resulting in Gnostic states of bliss. Assassinated in 1916 at the start of the Russian or Bolshevik Revolution, Rasputin was said to have the ability to heal others through the use of his heightened bioelectromagnetic energy. Born in 1876, Heinrich Arnold Krum Heller was a doctor, alchemist, Rosicrucian, German naval intelligence officer during World War I, and founder of Fraternitas Rosicruciana Antiqua a hermetic order in Brazil, and whose writings inspired the future internal alchemists such as Samuel Ein Weyor. Krum Heller claimed that the highest level of spiritual alchemical practices involved techniques of harnessing chi, prana, vril, all names for life force energy, and magnetizing one's blood to awaken dormant powers that are available to all people of any race or gender, regardless of religious beliefs. He claimed that practicing semen retention was vital, while at the same time engaging in prolonged and extensive tantric lovemaking. In the words of Krumheller, quote, This may be repeated as many times as desired without ever becoming tiresome. On the contrary, it is the magic key to daily rejuvenation, keeping the body healthy and prolonging life because this constant magnetization is a fountain of health. We know that in ordinary magnetism, the magnetizer communicates fluids to the subject and if the first has those forces developed, he can heal the second. The transmission of magnetic fluids is ordinarily done through the hands, or through the eyes, but it is necessary to say that there is no greater and more powerful conductor 
a thousand times more powerful, a thousand times superior to others than the virile member and the vulva as receptive organs. If many people practice this, they spread force and success in their surroundings for all those who come into commercial or social contact with them. But in the act of sublime, divine magnetization to which we are referring, both man and woman reciprocally magnetize each other, the one being for the other as a musical instrument which, when plucked, gives off or emits prodigious sounds of mysterious and sweet harmonies. The strings of that instrument are spread all over the body, and it is the lips and the fingers that make them vibrate, provided that the utmost purity presides over the act. This is what makes us magicians in that supreme moment. Sushi time. First up is baked mussels, which are cooked in dynamite sauce, which is basically spicy mayonnaise with some green onions. Probably my favorite appetizer in any sushi restaurant. Very delicious. I highly recommend it, especially if you don't like raw fish. Next is spicy tuna cut roll which is just like the name sounds, except it's not really spicy. So I add a small slice of ginger on top of each piece, which makes it taste better for me, especially with a lot of wasabi in the soy sauce. Next up is albacore sushi, which is very tender and soft and comes with something called ponzu sauce. And that's a very citrusy and brings out the flavor of the fish so I don't dip this one in soy sauce. I love this a lot as well. And for dessert, unagi sushi, which is cooked freshwater eel, which itself is a bit salty, but has a very, very sweet sauce. My favorite for the end. Very good. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very, very good. See you. Thank you. Soon. Now that was really, really good. Makoto Sushi on Ventura. Encino, California. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon and through all other major book outlets. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description. Please subscribe for future updates. Leave your thoughts below. Have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.